Good evening, I'm Dan Borshaw. Welcome to the Gama Festival here at Gonkala on the lands of the Gumach people of the Yolongo Nation. I pay my respects to the elders and the old people who have protected their country and proudly maintained their culture. Thank you for inviting us to share in some of your stories. Here to welcome us, Yadariki player TJ Manangaru. <laughs> As we prepare to vote in a referendum tonight, we bring together the different sides of the voice debate, and you'll hear directly from the people gathering here. Joining me on the panel, Yolongo Elder and co-principal of the Yirkala Community School, Meriki Ganambar Stubbs, Gunai Kurnai and Wachabalak journalist and writer Ben Abadangelo, Professor of Australian Indigenous Studies, Marcia Langton, Assistant Minister for Indigenous Australians, Malandiri McCarthy, and proud Wiradjuri woman and lawyer, Taylor Gray. And local legends King Stingray will be here with a musical performance a little later. Welcome to Q&A. Remember, you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please do get involved. We're here tonight to discuss the referendum and voice to parliament. And of course, disagreeing is a part of any conversation. It's just so important that we do that with respect. There's much at stake for everyone involved and how we have these discussions will inform the kind of nation we become. To get us started, here's a question from Jambawa Marawili. Hello everybody, um, my name is Chamba Amarawali from Blue Mud Bay, Ito uh, Amarapa clan, and here is my question. As the, time, as, the, as the last artist alive from of the Baronga Strike Bands, I must ask what shall, what shall be the first thing that voice to parliament should do. You should all speak from your own country. What, what do you think? Thank you, Jambawa. Uh, Malandiri. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Jambawa. And I certainly to acknowledge uh, that we're on Yongul country here. And, and it's just beautiful to be at Gulkala, even though we also commemorate uh, uh, Yunapingu, mm. whilst we're here, Dan. I would say, uh, Jambua, I feel we go to too many funerals. I think every week we're burying too many of our family. I would like to think that if we are successful uh, in this referendum, that we would focus on ensuring that we do close the gap. We see too many of our young people commit suicide, more so than non-Indigenous people in this country. Uh, we certainly don't have the life expectancy that we should. And I would like to think that if we are successful, Dan, in this referendum, uh, that there will be a concerted focus on making sure that our people survive. Mariki, if it were to be successful, what do you think is the first thing that a voice to parliament should be investigating? I think that um, the first thing I... That the day should be investigating is um, going to the people themselves, the root people that live on the land, um, because there are so many issues that concern and affect Yolngu right throughout the nation and ask, like, what is their... What do they want? Because every region, in whether it's Queensland, 
Northern Territory, Western Australia, they have different ideas and different way of doing things so that we can all come together as one people to open up non-Indigenous people, open up their minds and their hearts. Mm. Ben, what do you say to that? Uh, I think it's a great answer, um, first and foremost. And I do want to acknowledge as well that we're here on uh, Yongle Country at a very special time. The last time I was on Q&A um, was with Alan Jones talking about racism and Bridget McKenzie talking about integrity. So it's great to be in esteemed company. And I mean that sincerely. Um, I think it's, you, you know, every nation has different challenges and opportunities across the country. We recognise that there's no... Um, you know, homogeneity to uh, the, our experience as Indigenous people. But I think for me, what is at the core of who we are is, you know, our country and our kin, you know, people and place. So I recognise that we're in the midst of, um, you know, an existential crisis with climate change. And I think that First Nations people have an outsized role to play if any form of balance is to be restored. And I think that, um, yeah, doubling down nation to nation, region to region and putting First Nations people at the forefront um, is not only a way to sustain ourselves and ensure that we're strong, but really importantly, um, start to tilt, uh, you know, that spectrum back towards balance. Jumbo, what can I bring you back in? You've just heard from part of the panel. What do you say to that? And what do you think is the first thing that the voice to parliament, if it's successful, should do? Well, it is... Um on that day where we were before in 1988, that's it. Yeah. Uh, I think we have gave the message to the uh, parliament or to the prime minister uh, that could have been really happened and you know, gave us the really, really, really answer back to us, but didn't work. And I think um, why we have to let it go because you know if we, we indigenous people that we want to have right in our own country, uh, uh, the voice must be heard. And I think you know we need to fix that. Thank you, Mar Marcia. I want to bring you in on this question about what should be the first thing that the voice to parliament would do if successful? And, and surely part of that would be around design and about who's actually listening. Yes, that's right. Well, as you know, I uh, served with uh, Professor Tom Kalmer uh, as co-chair of the um, senior advisory group in the voice co-design process, and we presented two reports to... Uh, cabinet in the last government uh, and we put a lot of work over two and a half years into the design of the voice. So, you know, in the first instance, I imagine if if I were there, and I, I won't be, but, you know, hypothetically, I think the, the national voice, its first job would be to make sure that it has the views of all the regions, uh, the regional voices. That, that's very important. So when we designed the voice, we were mindful of the principles of inclusivity, uh, cultural authority, transparency, accountability, evidence-based uh, policy work, and uh, the need to table written reports and we suggested a, um, a parliamentary committee be established sitting alongside the bill scrutiny committee for instance to receive those written reports. Um, so the voice would have the role of scrutinising all legislation um, and identifying the bills that uh, are highly relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and also would play a role in the development of any such bills. Um, we designed the voice, uh, you know, with a particular kind of... the national voice with a particular kind of representation, say one from the ACT and, you know, 
two from this state, two from that state. We created an additional five seats. We recommended five extra seats for people from remote and very remote areas where the disadvantages are the most extreme. Um, we recommended a permanent advisory group made up of youth, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth, because 60% of the, our population, actually more than that now, are under the age of 25. And we recommended a permanent advisory group for people who live with disabilities, because one in four of our people live with disabilities. And so also the voice would have the ability to appoint, you know, advisory groups on particular matters that they need advice on. Uh, so there's that aspect of, of the, you know, administration uh, and design work that the national voice would be involved in. And in, in addition, it will take some time to establish all of the regional voices. So that is a a key matter for the next government, uh, or even one hopes this government. Um, but I see that, you know, groups are already convening across the country. Um, so there was a very interesting view put by the Central Australian people, convened by the, the Central Land Council, and their top priority was food security. So I think from memory their, their list of issues was food security, health, housing, uh, the high incarceration rates. Uh, so every remote region is going to have a list that looks something like that. Of course, one, another one will be uh, tackling the problem of keeping youth out of mm. detention centres. So here in the Northern Territory, 100% of the children in the detention centres are Aboriginal. Hmm. Um, so there's so much to do. Yeah. Taylor, I, I want to bring you in to round out this first question and take you back to that. And that's that, uh, what, what do you think should be the first thing that the voice to parliament would do if successful, coming from the perspective of your nation? Freehold title land. I think we need more land back. Um, and just reflecting on it from a New South Wales perspective, um, when we look at transactions that have occurred in, um, in Australia, in New South Wales, there, there was a time where we were compensated and land was redistributed to New South Wales. And it was done through the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. And what had happened was that's where you had the New South Wales or the state government, they, they re redistribute land to the land councils for the loss of land that occurred to Aboriginal people between the periods of 1984 to 1998. That's not enough. That's 14 years. A loss of compensation for land, and that's all we were compensated with. 14 years of land. Um, and, you know, it provided a statutory investment fund where Aboriginal land councils had to maintain $485 million in trust. And the statutory framework gave no flexibility whatsoever in, in times of financial crisis. We were never allowed to dip into that money. There's no self-determination in that. I think the first thing we need is, is freehold title lands where we can do what we want on the land. We can build universities. We can build law centres, Earl OYE. We can build all that on our terms. Land back, freehold title. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's stay on this topic. Here's Janice Hegener. Good evening. My question for the panel is why did the Prime Minister come here to Garma without a date for the referendum? Melon Deary. Great question. Um, one of the things the Prime Minister has said in the lead up to Garma is that, and he actually said this after we went through the constitutional alteration bill uh, in June, which was the final bill that we needed to pass in order for there to be a referendum. And he did say in that press conference that uh, the referendum itself required, uh, you know, 33 days uh, before it could be called. And uh, I think when he said that, and that was the first time I certainly heard it as well, uh, I realised then that he probably wouldn't call it uh, here at Gama. I think it's important that... Uh, we acknowledge that whilst Gama is an incredible gathering place for so many people here on Yolngu country, 
there are still so many First Nations people, but all Australians across the country, that still need to be reached. And I suspect that, uh, you know, the Prime Minister uh, has always said that he has to make the decision between October and December. And clearly, uh, if you look at the maths of that, that probably gives you an indication of uh, 33 days of working back from particular dates between October and December. And it didn't include uh, the first week of August. And the Prime Minister also said that we wouldn't be having a 10-week campaign while here on country. 10 weeks from now is roughly the 14th of oh, October. Well, you only have to ask Australians, right? I mean, how many times do you guys like going to the ballot box? Like, seriously. <laughs> and and so, obviously, uh, we're mindful of the fact that uh, uh, that there has to be a time that does work for, for Australians to go. I personally have certainly uh, hoped that the Prime Minister can do it long before the wet season in the north because it's uh, logistically difficult for those of us who want to get out uh, polling and for First Nations people or all of those cattle stations and people who live in the remote north uh, to be able to get to polling booths. So there's a practical uh, agenda there too, but um, I'm sure the Prime Minister's... Uh, being given all sorts of advice, but that's certainly one advice I've given. Just on that, <laughs> is the wet season and that's inaccessibility right. an active that's consideration massive. here? It's a, it's a massive, uh, you know, consideration. Uh, I, I've, you know, probably done about six or seven different forms of elections from territory elections and federal elections, and you know that that time of year is really difficult for those of us in the north uh, just logistically, Dan, we we find it tough. You know, you've got to have your four-wheel drives. You've got to get out there. You've got to cross rivers and causeways. And if the rain's coming, the rain's coming. And it's not just for those of us who are looking for the support at this referendum. It's just the practical work of the Australian Electoral Commission. Uh, all of their staff have to travel out in all of these remote and regional places. And it's, it's tough work. So do you reckon it's going to be the 14th of October? I reckon the earlier the better the Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> there you, heard it. you heard it here uh, first. Uh, I want to go to Marcia. The Prime Minister here, while here on country, has ruled out delaying the referendum. Uh, we've seen the polls trending in a way that many are not very happy with. If they continue in that towards the no side, the question has been suggested that it could be split into two parts. One about recognition and one about a voice. Do you, what do you think about that? Well, that is not what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people want. The majority of our people want constitutional recognition, uh, not just as a symbolic act, but also as a practical act. And they want that, sim that recognition uh, recognised through the establishment or the entrenchment of the voice in our constitution so that it cannot be disestablished by governments on a whim in the future. Taylor, how important is the date? Should we know it this far out or, or is this just part of the theatre of the politics of it? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I don't know, we should put, we should put it to our people first. When do, we, when do we want to hold it? I don't know the date myself. Let's ask, let's ask mob. I don't have the answer. What, what do you mean by that when you say let's put it to the people? Are you talking about the whole concept or just the date? Just the date. Just the date. I think the Prime Minister's got that power in uh, the legislation. But we're going to keep with this uh, discussion and we're going to go to Grant Paulson. If the voice fails, will First Nation Australians get an advisory body similar to ATSEC, which could be disbanded or done away with by any future governments? Ben. Well, I think if the voice fails, actually, it has to be regenerative for us. And I think that we must, as a collective, say goodbye to reconciliation and usher in an era of reckoning. And I think move away from this doctrine of recognition and move to a rights-based agenda, um, which is what we are absolutely deserving on. And I think the, there's a lot of doom about the no to this, but I think that there's also a lot of power in stepping away. And I think that the no leaves a clean canvas. I think that either way the referendum goes, we're still going to be 
confronted by a very slow and pervasive violence. I still believe that um, if the yes goes ahead, then the Commonwealth, which will be subservient to, will still be jointly controlled by fossil fuel, by fossil fuel companies and increasingly in the Northern Territory as well, the US military. Um, so I think uh, we'd need to get back to a rights-based approach, which is written out in all of the, you know, the previous bark petitions and political statements. And I think not lessen ourselves for an advisory body, but um, pursue something that gives us our rights. And that is self-government, self-determination, and something that will be able to sustain us and ensure that we have institutions that are centred around our ways of knowing, being and doing. Ben, can you just explain to us where you're sitting on the referendum and the, the voice to parliament discussion more broadly? Yeah, I feel as though that um, we are rec recognising us as peoples for me is nothing. Um, I think a, an advisory body speaking up to the same institutional machinery that has been slaughtering us forever and a day is unacceptable. I think that being subservient to a government which is jointly owned and controlled by fossil fuel companies and the United States military, um, that they rely on our land and resources. Uh, we are the, the necessary collateral damage. And I think moving forward as well, importantly for the northern half of the country, as you know, Australia looks to sell itself out as uh, a renewable energy, um, you know, supercharged renewable energy model, all of those critical minerals lay underneath the feet of First Nations people. So I see us, if the voice uh, goes ahead, you know, an era of a new and pervasive slow violence. And unfortunately, um, in the midst of an ecological collapse, us being positioned as the necessary collateral damage for the empire to once again change its face. Mataki, I want to bring you back in. This question goes to what happens if it fails and the potential of, or should there be a potential of some form of advisory committee in an ATSIC style? What do you think? Well, in um, all of Arnhem Land, in central Arnhem Land, we have what we call Adilak councils, where leaders of all clans come together. And this is, in this council, we solve our issues or we solve things that, you know, big issues that are coming into our, our countries. And in this council, we talk about what to do and how to do it all together from each of those clans. So, you know, something like that would be a really good role model um, for an advisory group, not like not, not like ATSIC, but as a, a leaders who come together from each of these clans in your regions. Mm. And, and you're a member of the, the Dilak Council. I understand you've just become a member not too long ago. What was it that drove you to that and why do you see this as being something that's important? Well, I think because I know I can talk, I can talk up and I can talk for my clan mm. and... Um, I think it is time that someone steps up. And, mm. you know, there, there are important things that the you all know or, or the, a leader would know. And to be able to talk through really, um, really issues that affect your clan, issues that affect children, mm. issues that affect education. And, um, you know, this DILA Council, they are strong. We help each other. We talk to each other. Well, next we're going to hear from Nagara Murray. In Victoria, we have a democratic elected voice. It's called the First People's Assembly of Victoria. I'm one of the co-chairs. Um, my question is... What can the panellists say to reassure us that the voice is just the first step and that government will follow through with treaty and truth, given the Uluru statement from the heart calls for all three? Marcia. Um, it's a question often asked. Um, in fact, there's a, a, a group who call themselves the progressive no's who are against the voice because they want a treaty first. Um, and uh, I think uh, 
they represent a profound misunderstanding about, first of all, uh, the nature of the potential treaties in Australia, but also a profound misunderstanding of how the governmental arrangements in Australia work. So uh, Victoria was the first cab off the rank in legislating for a treaty process. And it's been very successful. And I believe that uh, Nara has just been elected in the second First People's Assembly election. Um, so this is the second uh, term of that, of that assembly. And we uh, imagined when we were writing our voice co-design report that that assembly would be the basis for uh, the regional uh, voice arrangements in Victoria because there are representatives drawn from a number of regions in Victoria and they could advise on how they want to develop their own regional voices um, on the basis of self-determination. So Victoria is the most advanced jurisdiction in terms of negotiating a treaty and I believe that they're now moving towards the actual negotiations. We have treaty processes also in the Northern Territory and maybe Mullandiri can talk about that and also uh, in Queensland, uh, there's a, so in Queensland there's legislation um, and the, the treaty process is well underway in Queensland as well. So uh, whether there would be a statewide treaty or a number of treaties based on, you know, the people such as Gunai Kurnai or, you know, Yorta Yorta or uh, whatever, that, that is up to the local peoples to decide. Um, but you all see, the other thing is, we already have hundreds of Indigenous land use agreements. So uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart refers to agreement making. So voice treaty truth doesn't just refer to what people imagine treaties to be, but also to the entire <coughs> agreement making process. They're a fundamental part of uh, the Native Title Act is the um, right of people with native title interests to, to sit at the table and negotiate the terms of uh, proposals on their country. And as a result, uh, most of these agreements are already in place. There are hundreds that have their legally binding uh, contracts registered in the federal court and, and corporations and companies and institutions, Telstra, uh, have, have these partnership arrangements with the traditional owners all over the country. As we go forward, it's very important, I think, to read that report uh, of, I believe, the Referendum Council um, and, you know, the Uluru Dialogues on the Makarata, which is a, a term that... Uh, the great man from here, uh, gifted to the Uluru Convention uh, as a, you know, very important, powerful word for settling conflicts. And so as people figure out how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are going to live in this country and on what terms, he wanted that to be, you know, decisive and peaceful and... Uh, but so many people have negotiated away their native title rights, their civil rights, and there are many agreements that fall below acceptable standards. And so a, a Makarata Commission would mm. then uh, give advice to local groups on the standards that they should maintain, especially so that they don't negotiate away their own rights. If they don't have good enough lawyers, if they've got you know, people from the state government on the other side of the table uh, who are tough negotiators, they might, you know, forego a, a, an existing right. Mm. And we've seen that happen in a great many cases. So it's a complicated field. Uh, all of this is on the public record. It's, as I say, in law in several jurisdictions. Uh, it's registered on the National Native Title Tribunal website. All, all of the agreements. 
Yeah, it's, it's out there. You mentioned lawyers. Taylor, you're a lawyer. This is an area that you have been thinking a lot about. What's your take on it? I, I like what Ben says um, at the start. I don't, I don't think an advisory committee is enough. And I like what Professor Marcia Langton says as well, that, uh, you know, a treaty is not enough on its own. Dan, you and I spoke um, the other week about the United States and what they were doing. And, um, and you know, I told you we shouldn't, prepare, we shouldn't compare apples to oranges because somebody told me that. Mm. But it's important to draw on the lessons on, on what foreign jurisdictions are doing. They had 400 treaties, over 400 treaties and agreements in totals. One of them is yet to be honoured in totality, just one. So we need something more here in Australia as well. And, I, and again, I, I, I love looking at the United States to see what they're doing. And one thing, their approach is that they have what's called a fiduciary duty, that um, to look after and work on treaties with its First Nations people. And from that, it, it, they've, they've created what's called an Indian Claims Commission, which went from 1946 to 1978. And that dealt with fraudulent land transactions, a lot like what's happening here. Um, and and it, cre it had binding decisions as well. It had an arbitrator. And whatever the decision was from that commission that it was binding and it's not perfect, but I, I, I truly do believe it's a first step in general policy of, of restitution for the past betrayals. We could implement something like that here. Hmm. I think the Makarata Commission sounds fabulous. It, it, on, on the proviso that, you know, there's binding decisions because we look at New Zealand and we see what they're doing with their Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal and it gives recommendations. We know the issues with recommendations. The government doesn't follow that. I think I'd maybe add to that and to answer the question, what reassurances can I give? None. I mean, every time we've gone to the well, we've been pushed in. Um, you know, the Solicitor General's vice advice is clear that, uh, you know, the government doesn't have to listen, acknowledge, respond to any of the advice that it's given. The language has changed throughout the campaign significantly. Um, so I don't think that we can give any reassurances. And I think there's um, I think there is good theory and reasoning for why there's a lot of grassroots people that do want treaty first. Um, mm. You know, I recognise also why groups like Woodside and the Minerals Council and all these other fossil fuel companies that are in support of the Yes campaign would want a voice first. So I think, um, you know, and maybe building on what Taylor's just said, I don't see a treaty as an end game either. I think it's a first step in itself. But I think genuine ag agreement making that actually deals with the... the the voice doesn't deal with the heart of the issue here, that there's a, a foreign entity that's been imposed on these lands. I think we need to get to the heart of it with maturity, with the guise of reckoning and, mm. um, yeah, treaty and agreement making is, is absolutely something that we should continue and, to pursue. And can I just jump in on that as well? Like, I, I think a lot of the broader public forget um, the skills that First Nations people possess. In my fourth year of law school, I remember Dr. Bin Lee, the, first, the very first words that he said to our class was, Indigenous Australians are supreme dispute revolutionists and supreme negotiators. That is our innate her heritage. That's, that's us. And I just, and I want to flag as well, the, you know, the government's buying back land and I, I've had the privilege of sitting in with my supervisor and we spoke about um, the, pine, the pine plantation forest where the government purchased 125 hectares of freehold title land to harvest trees and nobody is batting an eyelid about that. Malanteria, I just want to run down on this question with you. The question goes to reassurances from the government about the voice being a starting point and then treaty and truth. And of course, we've heard about the Makarata Commission. What do you see as the government's role in a Makarata Commission and truth telling as part of that? Well, the Prime Minister said on the night, Dan, uh, when we won the election, that we would follow through with the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full, voice, treaty, truth. And it is important. Our, our country has uh, a history here uh, that we need to uh, look into and Makarata is an important word and we have different words in, in each of the, the different uh, First Nations groups there are that are coming together after a struggle and conflict. Uh, there is a great sense of healing uh, in that process but truth-telling is critical, uh, not only as a nation, you know, in terms of our country as a whole, but also individually, in families, in, in what we do and how we conduct ourselves. So we are absolutely focused, of course, on the first point of that, and that's the voice, 
Uh, we know how tough it is to win a referendum in this country. Uh, we've walked into this knowing how tough it is. Uh, certainly it's been made tougher by not having uh, the kind of bipartisan support that we had uh, certainly hoped for. And we have to stay focused on that, Dan. Uh, in all the years that uh, I've been able to work and, and certainly uh, serve the people of the Northern Territory, whether it's at a federal level or in, uh, in the Northern Territory Parliament, I too have looked at the structure of the Westminster system and see that unless we have uh, the opportunity uh, for First Nations people to influence the system in quite an important way, like a voice to the parliament, uh, then I think we're going to continue with the status quo as much as, you know, and it's interesting listening to Ben and Taylor, but, uh, you know, from my experience in the parliament, uh, we need uh, to have a greater sense of strength and power in being able to influence, and I do believe uh, the voice would do that if we are successful. And if you're just joining us, you're watching a special Q&A from the Gama Festival. And this is the first Gama since the passing of Gumach Trailblazer and leader, land rights pioneer and 1978 Australian of the Year, Yorna Pingu. And I pay my respects to his family, clan and people. In 2008, he wrote of this place and his education, saying, our ceremonial grounds are our universities where we gain the knowledge that we need in a sense, I wonder if we're all standing at the edge of those grounds this year as we talk about the future. Yona Pingu lamented the slow pace of change and consistently called for reform, saying that he wanted constitutional change to bring his people in from the cold and into the nation. Meriki, I wonder if you might reflect on the passing of this giant from your country and, and someone very close to you as well. Well, um he always told us that our land is the library, that our land is the university. Mm. He is a role model that has taught us to be strong, to be able to go out into the world as a strong Yolngu people, but be sure that you always, always have to know what the Balanda think. You always have to know how they think. He is a role model, and there are quite a few men and women, young men and women, who are in the audience that we all look up to. He was my role model, just like my mother, his older sister. Thank you. I want to bring in now Maureen Namana Yilk from Mamadawaran Outstation in West Arnhem Land. Hi, my name is Maureen Namana Yilk. I live at Mamadawaran Outstation in West Arnhem Land. I'm 16 years old and a school leader at Nautican Academy. My question is, two years ago, my community in West Arnhem Land fought for independent Indigenous-owned education. For the first time ever, I can go to school every day. Now I worry about my family living on other homelands. Kids are still turning up to empty schools buildings, hoping that a teacher will show up one, more than one day a week. It's fantastic that the government has given over $6 million to the Gamma Institution. Institute, sorry. But that won't reach the 1,000 unfunded indigenous children in Arnhem Land. When will, when will we get the same opportunity as every other child in Australia? What an outstanding question. Maragi, I want to start with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the question. Um, you said that you were in a private school. Um, there are so many private schools throughout Australia and a few uh, here, around here. Um, in uh, my experience, um, there was a school just down the road here where I went to, and uh, this school was the Vama College, and a lot of uh, Indigenous people 
right across from here to Western uh, Central and West, Western Arnhem Land who had come here. And it catered for year, tw uh, year seven all the way to year 12. Uh, we all lived together here, and, uh, but it wasn't a private school. It was uh, a public school, and, uh, and that's how uh, our parents wanted it to be. Uh, yeah, it was a really good school, but um, I myself personally um, don't believe in private schools. And because kids come to private schools and, um, and they're lost in the system. And um, we would rather um, work with the Northern Territory Education Government uh, to help each other, to have ideas shared together, to share right across um, Arnhem Land and the Northern Territory uh, and um, have a, a real good, uh, you know, so that we can work together. Th and thank you, uh, young lady. Um, if you, you know, you've got friends and you're a still young woman, uh, this is your future. Um, uh, tell your friends and your Balanda friends and whoever, you know, that um, uh, your children and, and indigenous of East Australia cannot be oppressed anymore. You know, we... Um, you know, the Valanda are, are recipients of the imperial uh, tradition, so please, everyone, vote yes. <laughs> One of the other areas, Dan, and I, I think is, is homelands and outstations. Mm. Uh, what you're doing is terrific, your mob, um, out there, and we need to ensure that there is more support for homelands and outstations across the Northern Territory, but also in other jurisdictions. I've just come from the APY lands. I know that there are questions around that, which I want to try and understand uh, from the South Australian government. But in the Northern Territory, we've been pushing, and I know uh, Marion Scrimger, who's a member for Lingiari, has been absolutely passionate about that in terms of the communities here, Dan, uh, that we have to see the homeland supported. And we did that through $100 million uh, to the Northern Territory to ensure that that would keep going and we want to keep working on it. But the other area that we're having a problem is in the Senate uh, with the housing fund. You know, we need to be able to pass pieces of legislation that can enable us to give the houses where we need them right across Australia, but in particular in places uh, like where Maureen comes from. Thank you. And next we have a video question. This one is coming in from uh, Narelle McRobbie. I am a tribal Aboriginal and I hate the welcome to country. As a tribal person, why? Welcome every other bastard on country when I, as an Aboriginal person, have never felt welcomed on my own ground. On my own dirt, never been felt welcome. Welcome everyone in to continue to take, 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 take. What do you reckon? Ben, what do you reckon? Well, the unwelcome or you're not welcome, um, I think it poses some really hard truths. And um, we see, you know, blackfellas and the generosity and the spirit of care that is innate to who we are as a peoples, um, despite the enduring mess that continues to get imposed on us still turning up to um, provide safe passage and welcoming to people who are often doing the oppressing. So I think it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, right? Uh, you know, we see welcome to Canberra's at, at welcome to countries in Canberra for policymakers then to go and institute rations cards or to finance fossil fuel companies against the wishes of indigenous peoples like Middle Arm. I've seen Uncle Richard Fijo here and knowing that the government is pursuing gas expansion against the wishes of the Larrakia. You know, they're 
passing deep sea dumping bills, uh, which enables gas expansion against the, the wishes of the Tiwi traditional owners, fracking in the Beetaloo Basin. I mean, the list goes on. So, um, yeah, I think to Arnie's question, it's, um, I love the way that she's reframed it and I think it, uh, it, it causes paucity in the thinking and, yeah, maybe it's time that we stop being so welcoming. Marcia, what do you think? Uh, we were welcomed here uh, by Jawa Yunapingu this morning uh, in his language. Uh, the Gumach own their land here. It was granted under the Aboriginal Land Rights Act in the Northern Territory many years ago and the, the land is owned in trust by, for the traditional owners by a traditional owner trust. So this um, land rights arrangement here is the the best in the country um, and was, you know, developed at a time when such rights were conceivable. Um, the opposition to our rights uh, since has been rather ferocious uh, and we're seeing that in this debate. Uh, I think many Aboriginal people around the country are who do not have their land rights and face the kind of racism that uh, our interlocutor would, have, would face in North Queensland uh, would feel quite differently. She would, I imagine, and I'd like to hear more, feel that she can't welcome people to her country unless she has formal rights in her own country. And... I've seen the racism in North Queensland. I worked mm. there for many years. It would be a, a terrible burden on a traditional owner to welcome people who hate Aboriginal people. That's, that's the truth of it. Uh, in some parts of Australia, it's like that. And we see the surge in racism in the referendum debate. And going back to the question of treaties, the reason why we're discussing this is because it's been raised by the opposition leader as a scare tactic, uh, uh, saying that, you know, the voice is uh, a Trojan horse and uh, the government's being secretive about the real intentions of negotiating a treaty. So as I indicated before, all of this is in the public domain. It's legislated in at least two states. There are the Indigenous land use agreements and furthermore, the opposition spokesman has been speaking personally to corporate leaders um, and s telling them that uh, they're wrong to support the voice. And I know some of them have explained to him that they have formal Indigenous land use agreements, registered contractual arrangements, they're registered in the federal court and that, you know, these are uh, not only reflect the values of the company but the compliance of uh, companies with Australian laws. Um, and uh, with international standards set by their shareholders. So um, the opposition spokesman thinks nothing of that and continues to hoodwink the public into believing that uh, the corporations that are parties to Indigenous land use agreements under the Native Title Act have been uh, hoodwinked into a woke position. So this is all, you know, language from the United States it's a particular kind of campaign tactic. It should have no part in Australian politics and uh, the Australian people are entitled to know the truth about Indigenous policy. It's much more complicated and complex than the opposition spokesman um, would have you believe. And I've been uh, really disturbed by the debates of the last uh, while, especially during the last week. Uh, nobody's being deceptive about treaties. They're well underway. Uh, in Victoria and in Queensland. In WA. And, yes, and in WA, uh, where four Indigenous land use agreements have been legislated as a, the Noongar settlement by the Western Australian Government. Uh, and therefore, the Crown in Western Australia is a party uh, to that settlement. It's a comprehensive settlement. And on those grounds, according to Professor George Williams' uh, it could be described as a modern treaty. 
because that's what modern treaties in Canada look like. So uh, it, in some parts of Queensland, it's entirely to whip, uh, possible to whip up hysteria mm. about, you know, Aboriginal people getting rights that other white people don't have. Uh, it all sounds rather like, you know, 92, 93 in the Queensland election when Pauline Hanson was elected. Uh, the, the, the debate has shifted mm. to, a, you know, kind of... Pauline Hanson One Nation uh, platform and uh, Australians who don't keep up with all of the complexities of, of policy and legislation don't understand that despite that vast uh, administrative regime sitting over the top of us and the legislative regime, people still don't have houses, children still don't have schools, that teachers, the young lady just told us that their schools are empty because the teachers are not turning up because there are no teachers. This is a desperate situation. Education is a very high priority for us and yet we don't have the teaching force in our communities. Um, and yes, it's the responsibility of the states. So this is another function of the voice that's tremendously important. Uh, so we imagined when we were uh, designing the regional voices, that they would have direct relationships with state and territory governments and therefore start to sort out these education problems. Uh, but the national voice would have the convening power of a national advisory body to bring the Commonwealth, the states uh, uh, together to resolve uh, matters of national priority like education. There are no hardly any secondary schools in remote Australia. Mm. There are so few, and this is why private schools are stepping in um, and providing scholarships yeah. to children in remote areas because there are no hardly any secondary schools. Mm. They're not getting a secondary education. Maladere, I want to bring bring you in. What do you? How do you feel when you hear N Narell saying <coughs> that she doesn't feel welcomed on her own dirt? And we might need to just keep it a little brief or sure. <laughs> hurtling towards the end of the show. Okay. Well, firstly, um, uh, thanks, Aunty Norella. I think that's important to hear your views. And it is good to hear it from the perspective that you don't feel welcome yourself. Mm. But can I just say to uh, the audience here, Dan, and, and to those watching, that one of the things I get when I travel across the country is a lot of people say to me... Uh, we didn't know this. We didn't know this about First Nations people when I was at school. You know, we didn't know about these issues. We weren't taught about the history of First Nations people. We didn't even know anything about the land that I grew up on, that it was Wiradjuri or that it was the Yanua or that it was the Larrakia. So, so I hear a lot of that. And what I see from our younger generation now, I mean, even my own, my own girls, you know, they know which country we're walking on and whose land. And these kids, these next generation of Australians, know about First Nations people in this country and they know that there were people here well before 1788. And I think there is a much bigger message here. Yes, I hear the individual hurt, but I would say to those out there and to Aunty Norell, I hear you, but I think collectively for our country, it is a good thing. And if First Nations people do not wish to welcome, they have a choice to say no when invited or asked to do so. I just think it's a, a poignant question and, you know, riddled with possibility because we are... I mean, how undignifying is that to think that you are obliged to provide safe passage to welcome people when you don't even feel safe or sound on your own soils when you are trampled on? Um, and I think within that question, that, that calls for paucity and within that paucity, there's possibility. I think it's a valid question and uh, for, what, for what it's worth from my perspective, if you want to say no to welcoming people on your land, say no. But I will leave you with this. Um, yet another quote, Dan. Um, and it, and it You've got was, some great quotes. And it was, it was, it's an Indigenous man who was a profess, professor in political science and he said this, we will never have a powerful lobby or be a smashing political force but we will have intangible unity, which has carried us through centuries of persecution and we will survive. We will survive because we are a people unified by our humanity, not a pressure group unified for conquest. 
that is the legacy that our mob come from. Mm. Mm. Erti, I want to come to you to round out this conversation about... Uh, um, perhaps start with your response to what you heard from Narelle about the pain that she's feeling. Narelle, I'm not sure which... what welcome you are talking about, whether it's welcome to country, your country, or whether it is visitors coming into your country. But I will tell you a story, Narelle. There was a time when even I don't remember people in uh, Western Australia or people in, in Sydney welcoming welcoming non-Indigenous people or other peoples. I know because I remember, I'm going to say your name, Markup, Jambua, Marawili, and his clan went to Sydney. And this was quite a few years ago. And they went there to open an exhibition. And I remember, I didn't go at that time which I usually do, you know, a whole, whole uh, lot of us families go there. But this time I didn't. And I remember that there was a smoking ceremony on the top of a building. And you had a big tin with leaves in it. And they smoked it because there were so many people that you smoked that day. So this, this smoke was coming out from the tin, right? Mm. And then the people started coming around the tin so that they could be touched by the smoke. means welcome to our exhibition. And from then on, that smoking ceremony started happening everywhere. In the Yulngulo, in the Yulngulo room, smoking is only done after death has been finished, after initiation of young boys, and of course the birth of a child. That's when the smoking only is done, and only by leaves and fire. Nothing to do with big beans or anything like that. Thank you. And that's almost all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Meraki, Ganamba, Starbs, Ben Abbott, Angelo, Marcia Langton, Malandiri, McCarthy and Taylor Gray. Thank you for sharing your stories and questions. And thanks to you at home for joining the conversation on streaming and streaming us on iView as well. Next week, Patricia Carvelis will be back with you live from Sydney with journalist and author Angela Saini, Australian Chief Scientist Cathy Foley, University of Sydney Vice-Chancellor Mark Scott, astronaut Megan Christian and founder of Deadly Science, Corey Tutt. Head to the Q&A website to register to be in the audience. Gama is renowned for the many talented local musicians who feature throughout the festival. So we're leaving you tonight with a performance we recorded a little earlier from King Stingray. Here there they are with their single, Looking Out.
Now we're looking out into the water. 